when I moved here and when I even wrote on my website about it was the hardest time in my life moving here, there was a lot of other personal things that I went through in Florida that made it really, really difficult for me to, you know, strip away and be like solo essentially. Um, so the biggest thing that I reminded myself when I woke up every day, I would, you know, if I was stressed about anything or if I just didn't see the path, I just reminded myself day by day, step by step. And that led me to my patience and led me to take the next step. And what can I do right now with this time that I have on me to be productive? That's mm -hmm. all that matters right now. Cause that's all I have to work with. Cause mm -hmm. I can't be all these different things that I want to be right now. It has to start somewhere. Purpose in the Purpose in the Youth. Purpose in the Youth Podcast. Welcome, welcome back. Welcome back to the Purpose in the Youth Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Purpose in the Youth Podcast. What's your favorite beard man? The one, the only Bob A. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Purpose in the Youth podcast. What's your favorite bearded man, the one, the only, Bob Bay, first ever professional skinboarder in the house, Amber Torrealba, how you doing today? Super stoked. Oh wow. my God. Doing awesome. This has been six months in the making. We've been kind of chit-chatting back and forth on Instagram DM, Yep. and I'm pumped that you're here today. I'm super stoked. This is really cool to come out here. You crush it on the waves. <laughs> I've never seen anybody shred so hard, like with... with not even on the skimboard too, but then the visual content you're putting out, it's honestly amazing that you can kind of balance both of these passions at once. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. You love it? I love it so much. It's Every single crazy. day. Yeah. Every single it's day. This is what I do. I don't know, even if I wasn't paid for it. So. And you're based in La uh, Laguna right now. Laguna. And that's, would you argue, maybe some of the best waves along Southern California coast? Or yeah, for skimboarding, definitely. For skimboarding? Yeah. Is that just a capital for skimboarders? I would say, yeah, that's like the mecca of skimboarding in uh, California and really United States. Now, do surfers and skimboarders have beef? Uh, if they don't really like have that respect, but I'd say most surfers have a lot of respect for skimboarders and vice versa. Mm, Cause I know with, with, uh, with snowboarding and, and skiers, it's a little it, different. It can be a little bit hot water. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't say it's like the same like that, but, um, it's crazy cause a lot of surfers, they don't skimboard, but a lot of skimboarders surf. So it's kind of cool to really see, you know, that respect they have for us. Cause it's like kind of more of a skatey type of style of surfing when you're skimboarding or it even mixes a little bit of snowboard feel too. And do you, do you think it was easier for you to get on a skimboard because you had the skating background? 100%. Really? It, yeah. It was, it was natural like, from the jump? Totally. And I think like, because I started skateboarding like early on, but mm -hmm. when I was skimboarding, it was more of just like when the rain would come through in Florida and you're like, oh, well, I have this wooden board and let me just throw it and like skate on the water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's kind of how it started. And just naturally kind of picked up and grew and grew. Yeah, I didn't even really know you could ride waves with a skimboard when I first like held a skimboard. It was probably more of a boogie board that I was using oh, as a skimboard. Oh, OG boogie board. <laughs> yeah, the OG like boogie board. Whatever like came from Walmart or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had seen, uh, I was obviously deep diving into a lot of your content uh, preparing for this podcast, but there, one of your recent videos, it was called Do What You Love. And there was a line that really stuck out to me and you said, stay true to who, uh, stay true to you and do what you do for the right reasons. The rest will follow. How has staying true to who you are gotten you to where you are today, do you think? I feel like it's everything. I feel like um, a lot of what I've done has been along the paths of what is actually my true passion. And I've had a lot of chances to go other routes and honestly for more money and mm. maybe even just a bigger career in a sense. But I've really just tried to stay grounded and realize like, the money isn't what makes me happy and I learned a lot of that from the corporate side of what I was working you know mm -hmm. in retail and things like that so I learned that you know no, mu no matter how much money I had it wasn't gonna really make me happy I was just gonna continue to work on things that I didn't like so even in the even in those early years of you really getting into the whole skinboarding world like did you have a specific vision of like I want to take this as far as I can, but I want to make sure, like I want to make sure that I can make a living doing this, but I don't want to allow myself to do this. Like, was there any true vision that you had going into like skimboarding? Early on in skimboarding, I feel like um, there was barely any girls. So I was like, wow, like 
could I be like one of the, like the top girls was like the first initial thought because I was so like young and competitive and I came from like other sports and playing mm-hmm. basketball and I was like, well, this would be really cool. But the more I grew into it, I was like, wow, this is such a cool and unique sport. Like I wish more girls did it. And I was like, man, I just want to just do this all the time. I kind of just became obsessed with it, but I didn't really see like an end game. I didn't really see like the path at all because there was only a few pro girls out there. I don't, I didn't know of anyone really making a living off of it. Wow. So it's just kind of like something that was a dream, but I had really no idea where to take it. It was just an obsession in a sense of like, oh, I just got to go skimboard, you know? Why do you think there wasn't a lot of women doing it? Um, I feel like it's, it's a sport that was very small too because it was kind of picked up probably from surfing and also kind of originated in Laguna Beach and and especially in Florida there's not as many waves so you kind of just would be like the tourists would be skimming down the side of the beach or something like that so not many women were exposed to it and even today I feel like a lot of girls are just like whoa like girls do this you know and um, I just feel like they really there's a lot of stuff that people need to learn about skimboarding still and women can have that have tried it I have seen been kind of as you know, lit up by it as as I was when I started because it's just a very different type of sport. Where do you think you got the confidence to kind of even give yourself the permission to chase after that? Because it takes a lot of confidence, especially when you're... Yeah. It's one thing if I wanted to tomorrow say, I'm, I want to go in the NBA, okay? There's obviously a lot of males trying to compete and do that, but not only are you trying to compete on a professional level on a level but there's nobody out there for you to follow the steps of like that takes a lot of confidence to say i'm still gonna find a way to make this work yeah definitely i feel like i went back and forth so many times with it because i skimmed when i was um in high school and then you know high school kind of got in the way and basketball got in the way and then i went to college and then college got in the way Mm. and but i would keep going back to the beach you know i'd be living in orlando which is the inland of florida and i'd Mm -hmm. be driving you know an hour and a half to get to the beach just on any break from work or school that i hour and a half even being in orlando florida yeah i would just like sometimes i'd just drive down and my friends would laugh at me like you dude you're coming down here for a couple hours just to see the beach i'm like i miss the beach you know i i made that choice to go inland for college and i didn't Mm, realize how much the beach meant to me yeah. So that was a, a real like awakening as well. Just all that gas I would use, just I it just kept getting drawn back to the beach. If I was stressed from like college or work or anything, like just being landlocked, I felt so like trapped. <laughs> yeah. Where and you grew up? Uh, was it Melbourne, Florida? Is that the actual place? Yeah. So technically, I grew up in Palm Bay, Florida. But if I say Palm Bay, nobody really knows where Palm Bay is. So I say Melbourne, which is like the main kind of city over there. And what's this environment like for you growing up? How would you describe it? Um, just like it was a very small neighborhood really it was just a bunch of kids on a street we really could you could barely there was only like a corner store you walked to there was no like city or anything like it took me like 45 minutes or more probably to get to the beach when I was younger so that's why I kind of fell into like skateboarding and like traditional sports there's anything you play on the street just like mm. tackling each other and playing man hunts so. yeah so I grew up a very like tom girl life or uh, tomboy life any brothers so. or sisters one sister, but okay. we're we're complete opposites. Actually. Complete, but we, we inspire each other in different ways because she's like uh, like a musician. So mm. in that sense, we still have the art. There's a little bit yeah. of art creativity, right? Yeah, but it's cool because like we've always kind of played that like opposite side where like oh okay I can see like how you've kind of been inspired by art and or things differently than me, but we've also been both very passionate about things and yeah. both very driven. So it was cool to kind of follow in her steps of of also like going to college and doing all those things and just you know getting the work done just to get the paper and stuff what was the true inspiration for you to pick up a skateboard was it, were you watching tony hawk was it bob <laughs> burnquist was it the x games what was getting you to actually hop on a board i really wish i remember like that key thing that made me get on a skateboard when i was younger but i i think i was just a reckless kid to yeah. be honest and i think i probably just stumbled across the skateboard at the store and eventually talked to one of my like my parents or something to get it and then i probably just ended up rolling around <laughs> and it evolved from there i was i was literally on every thing i could probably get my hands on scooter like, bikes everything yeah like i'd be the kid you know riding no hands trying to oh, like come get on, my man. get my mom like scared and stuff so we we were like reckless kids because we kind of grew up in like that neighborhood where like it was just us and like some woods around and we would just build forts and do crazy did stuff. you just love like the thrill like what was the 
what was getting you to get on the board, get on the bike, get on the scooter? Why, what was it about the thrill that you were like, I got to keep doing this? It was definitely the adrenaline, but also it was always like, I always wanted to like have a personal goal. I feel like that was a big thing that I still recognize today is like, mm. I'm always setting little personal goals for myself. Like if I do something, I'm like, oh, I want to do this better. I want to do this in a different way or like, and you know, I was very competitive as a younger kid. I feel like I'm um, a little less now and you know, I have to be for competing and skimboarding, but it was cool to see like that kind of fire in me when I was little kind yeah. of it evolved into, you know, being even competitive on the business side or striving for my goals. Yeah, well, I would imagine somebody that's a world champion skimboarder has to have some type of competitiveness <laughs> to you. You can't Definitely. just casually like brush <laughs> off like second or third place. You, there has to be some desire or fire inside you of saying like, I'm the best in the right way though. Like mentally right. hyping yourself like i can do this totally. i can get first place or whatever the challenge might be against other people yeah and i love it because i mean to be honest i've lost more than i've won anything so mm. it's cool that like all those competitions that i did lose it's really cool to see like how i feel after winning just that one you know mm -hmm. it, it just it means so much more the losses end up almost like fueling you to work even harder because yeah. you win it's like great i won i got the prize yeah you don't come in first place you know there's only more room for improvement where you can easily get complacent if you're number one every single time it's like okay I'm just gotta keep doing the same thing over and over and over yeah it keeps the dream going you know yeah you uh you played basketball and track growing up yeah mm -hmm. i uh I did a basketball track and then i also did like a bunch of little like just sports on the side what was your favorite of all of them i would say basketball for sure because mm -hmm. just like the speed and the strategy and just like i played point guard too so it was really cool having a team to really work with and like running the plays and it was just like i had a really tough coach honestly but i respect him because it really put that discipline in me. Like we were just, com like whether we were competing or not, we were practicing all year round, like m sometimes mornings and night after school. And you know, it just never stopped, but. Interesting. I would have thought you would have said track only because I feel like track, depending on certain, uh, obviously there's a bunch of different ways you can compete within track, but a lot of them I think are you versus other opponents. Right. And somebody that enjoys skateboarding is, is skimboarder, you would think that I'm. You would you would go towards the sport where it's like all the weight is on your shoulder, and I don't have to worry about anybody else. I guess it was cool with basketball in a sense. I got that as well. I got a little bit of both worlds because mm. by being point guard, it's kind of all the weight is on your shoulders because mm. you're calling the plays. You're right. So it was really cool. Um, you know, there's another point guard that you know if I wasn't in, she was in, and like you know, it was kind of always you had your backups and like you know, we had our each other's backs, but at the same time, it was just really cool that like, you kind of had to call the play, but yeah. then it was rad that your team always kind of backed you up and you can rely on them. Yeah, before we get into uh, the college years of you having to drive an hour and a half both ways, what, what do you <laughs> think it was about the beach or like, what did you love? Was it, did you go to the beach because you were getting into skimboarding at a young age or were you naturally just somebody that loved being by the water and just the energy of it all? I think it's that, like definitely the energy of just being by the water. And then like, it was great that like, you know, me being like kind of an active kid, I kind of found sports at the water. Mm. But like, I feel like anytime I was even stressed or like, even if I was just listening to music, I would just yeah. sit at the beach, just yeah. like stare at the ocean. And yeah. I don't know, it just for hours sometimes you know you just or if i didn't even know where to go sometimes in college i'd be like oh, man, i'm so stressed like just drive to the ocean like no plans or anything even if it was just to like you know grab a hot chocolate or something yeah. i don't drink coffee so i can't yeah, at all get, no coffee at all no like oh i don't my. know god bless your soul don't don't get into it it's like a I, drug it's literally a drug <laughs> i feel i totally believe that and i think i'm just gonna keep rolling with the fact that i don't drink it but i feel like i don't need the like more energy i'm usually trying to chill because yeah. i'm always like you're always on the go, go already yeah so I like to just kind of relax my mind more than anything and kind of go on the beach does that as well. I don't trust anybody that says they don't like the beach. Like if you don't, if you're somebody that doesn't want to go in the ocean because there's <laughs> animals and it's gross. Okay. I understand. But if you're somebody that just says you generally don't like the beach, I don't trust you. I yeah. don't want to be around you because I love the beach. I would, if I could live a stone throw away <laughs> from the beach, I'd be there every single morning meditating, reading, and just like trying to tan my irish skin but yeah. <laughs> I, I love the beach i absolutely love the beach definitely what was uh you ended up going to university of central florida mm -hmm. you were a marketing and digital media major um but going into school i don't know if it was your freshman year you end up launching a skateboard company true yeah. skateboards uh you guys have sponsored team decks merch i mean this wasn't just 
I'm going to start a skateboard company and sell t-shirts. You had the whole works going. What was like the inspiration to start the company in the first place? Well, so when I went to college, I felt like I really almost lost my opportunity to be involved in skateboarding in a sense of like being an athlete. I felt like I was so into it when I was like 13 and I was even wanting to compete and do all these things. And I was at the skate park every day. And I feel like when I got to be 18, I was like, oh, well, I just finished high school and I was so focused on track and basketball that took up all my, you know, my four years in high school, Mm -hmm. I was just focused on traditional sports. And by the time you're like, okay, well, I decided not to play college for basketball because I felt like I was going to get injured and I may lose a scholarship for that. And so there was a chance you were, you were going to try playing 100%. I was fully about it for a while until probably my senior year. Um, the, it was like a blessing because I had this opportunity to do like a fast track to college to where my senior year I didn't even go to high school. So I was in I was enrolled in high school, but I went to college at the community college down the street. And mm. it was great because I could like plan my like classes on only two days of the week because <laughs> that's the college life. Yeah. So at 18, it, while all your friends are still in the high school structure of 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. you were only going to class two days of the week 100 percent. and at first like you know when they pitch you the idea i think it was like i don't know i think it was sophomore or 11th grade you had they were like okay so we have this new thing going on like who wants to do it and like i had the grades to do it so i was like oh what's this and they're like you get to go to college early and a few people immediately they're like screw that you know yeah, I don't they want to do delay more work. It. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. they wanted then, to delay it exactly and they want to like hang their hang with, with their friends at in high school and i was like all right wait so you're telling me that i could get a free year of college and I don't have to go to high school let me hear more and then I, I got into that and so by only going to school two days of the week I found myself going back to the beach my senior year so while I still had to go to basketball practice because I was still on the basketball team and enrolled in high school I was spending half of my days at the beach trying to practice skimboarding and getting and learning that mm. instead of playing basketball so this whole like freedom and sense of expression started to like really come back to me of like board sports and like how individual sports like that you know you're I I practice when I want and I do what I want when I want and like it's kind of like when I was have to be oh I got to be back at basketball at like 3 30 like oh but the waves are good like yeah. you know I started to feel like this I was torn I was like wow like this sport that I loved so much and I thought I had this whole career ahead of me like I wanted to be in WBA and like mm. all this stuff wow and, you really were visioning this dude huh? I was like the captain of like my team at some point and like you know it's just like holy crap like I started to just switch and you know it was like I, I even a couple of times I'm pretty sure I got in trouble for being late to practice for being at the <laughs> beach and I'd come like with sand in my hair and I'm putting on my jersey I wonder where Amber was she yeah. was surfing it up and everybody's like coming from the locker room and I you know it started to really like hit me I'm like damn dude like I just like this is where I want to be. And um, yeah, so I started really getting into skimboarding then. And I, I decided that after college, I mean, high school ended that I didn't want to play anything in college. I wanted to just go to school to get the degree and focus on, you know, doing what I want. So you still felt like you had to go to school though, even though you started feeling for this idea of, I want to m- maybe take this seriously on top of starting the skateboarding brand you still felt i need to go to college yeah i feel like i was still stuck in that traditional mindset where you you go to college it's just something you got to do the benefit of that though was i had a bright future scholarship and it's like one of those things in florida that i don't know if any other states have it but if you have the grades you get like 75 to 100 percent of your of your school paid for so i was like hustling in high school because i kind of had to also because of um you know basketball and all that I i just didn't want to like do bad for like you know my mom and she you know she was always hustling to help us it was she was a single parent so I was like oh well I don't want to do bad in school like I don't want to cause her issues so um I basically was just kind of just doing that and I realized you know like if I'm gonna get out of high school and go to college I might as well just get the degree get it over with with this paid for yeah and And so pass it as I say if they're offering to pay a good amount of your school at that point it's kind of what do I have to really lose? I mean, if I can get a degree for 80% off of what it normally costs, yep. I feel like I kind of should do this. And to the whole traditional method, everyone's going to college. 
I probably should do this and I can still have my free time to work on the passion and the skateboarding company. Definitely. And like that was basically when I got into college. I was just so I never liked school to be honest. I, I don't think just, anybody ever does. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't trust you if I don't trust you if you don't like the beach and I don't trust you if you say you really yeah. love school. Those are the two things right there. Exactly. I mean my grades didn't reflect like how much I hated school. Like mm-hmm. I tried but like I just was so over it and I guess I got bored in college is kinda of what it was. It's like I had a part time job at Radio Shack which I didn't realize what that was gonna turn into in the future as well. But I was working part-time at Radio Shack and I was going to uh, college and it was like dude like just let me just get my homework done and do something like fun like creative that I want to work on and I never had time to always skate and I felt like I was getting older and I was going to destroy my body so I was like well let me create a skateboarding brand and I just that just came up and I decided to I was always skating back home with all these kids at shred and it was insane I was like holy crap if these kids had an opportunity and I just started thinking of like all this stuff and it snowballed and I just created this brand and started sponsoring local kids and one of the kids now is a pro skateboarder no way and he even engraved my uh the brand of true skateboards on like one of his like first little boards wow it is insane that was like a real full circle moment. and i'm sure you gave him like a little taste of hope that if somebody like yourself who's running a brand it was believes in me then there's potential that i could become something even bigger 100 percent. i believed in that kid so much and it's really cool to see him like killing it nowadays when you were bringing those people onto the team was it a mix of like both male and female or did you find it was more male dominant because obviously skateboarding probably in male dominant sport just as much as skimboarding is yeah to be honest i didn't even i couldn't even find a girl really like that i yeah i barely even came like in contact with a lot of girls that skated when especially at that age when i was like 18 in the local parks it was all guys wow there were some girls that um if i think about it now that are like going pro now like they were not of like probably five years younger than me so they probably weren't even at the parks then they were probably in school or like didn't even start yet and i was thinking like wow like that's probably why like things kind of unfolded the way that they did but it's cool that i was able to make some sort of like impact hopefully for you know that kid and we even kind of brought him to some contests and stuff and it's cool to sponsor that's awesome that is so cool while you were in school though you had mentioned uh you were working a little bit with radio shack Mm -hmm. and that ended up because you were with them for i think almost seven years yep uh and at one point you're managing a million dollar radio shack which is that is no that's no joke like that's some real shit um What do you think was one of the greatest lessons you took away from that experience? I learned um, how much I didn't want to follow a traditional path. Hmm. I really did. Um, But I learned a lot of discipline through it, like having to manage employees, having to really stay on your grind. And it's really your responsibility. At the end of the day, I like to take a lot of like, you know, it's I'm accountable for, you know, decisions that I make and things that unfold because of, you know, you could always make a decision and with a lot of the stuff that I did in Radio Shack you know I kept deciding to stay and another year and another year and manage a store and take this promotion and like stoked on the money and then eventually it was just like well what is what even is it does it mean in the future you know Mm. for me like my passions and what like life meant for me and what I wanted to do I just had so many like things I was passionate about so eventually I was just sitting in four walls like okay like this is my every day and I was just like this is before Instagram really got big too like I believe it was just really Facebook that was kind of like the social media of the time and I think when Instagram came out I was in my second or third year of managing Radio Shack and I found myself you know in the back room scrolling on Instagram and like being like well why am I not out here creating my content or all this stuff every day and displaying it and really Instagram was more of a joke for me at first I was just like just had some photos that I was like oh I can edit on this weird app like Mm -hmm. because I was usually just editing on my computer and at the time I was really into like photography and videos but more for just a hobby okay so um I basically was just like throwing stuff up every once in a while but once I realized like how big of a tool it was, I believe I had only like a few photos up there that I thought was just Instagram was just an editing tool. Mm -hmm. I deleted those and I realized like, holy crap, I graduated from um, college and instead of marketing so many other companies, I wanted to just like focus on maybe marketing what I enjoyed and kind of putting the message out there of what skimboarding was because no other girls were doing it. Yeah. And I was like, well, maybe if I just start putting out, you know, what I like of these photos, these GoPros, I would always walk around with a GoPro and just get cool angles. <laughs> it's like, oh, nobody's got this angle yet. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just hoping that like, you know, putting that out there that, um, you know, 
I don't know. I really had no idea. <laughs> yeah, and that's just... well, that's the beauty of it. That's that's this is what these podcasts and these conversations are like because it's so easy for somebody to click into Amber, who you are today, see all the content, see all the the brands you're working with, and and there was one point in time you had no idea of what you were doing. Yeah, we're working at Radio Shack, which is fine if that's something people want to do, but you knew this isn't what I want to do. There's this tool that could possibly turn into something big. Let me see where this could take me. Yeah. But Definitely. you were, but you were, uh, were you, did you graduate at 20? I graduated at 20. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, so you got out of quick. high school pretty I was quick over and, and then you got out of college pretty quick. I was so over it, dude. I did everything I could to just, all right, this course I need. All right, this will get me on this fast track. All right, yeah. cool. I'll take it. I'll take it. Like I was so over, I almost wanted to drop out at one point because I was making so much money. And I was from, like, oh, from the radio shack. Yeah. So was, it was, it was and, like, why am I wasting time here when I'm actually making money over here? Right. And I had a separate job. At one point, I got like all these side jobs and I, I left Radio Shack for like only like six months, but like to do like sell 4G internet before it even existed. Jeez. <laughs> it was like um, like called WiMAX at the time. It was like the 4G that you could get before you could get it on your cell phones and I made a ton of money with that. And I was calling my mom like, I have all these business opportunities. I can make six figures and why do I need to go to college? And she's just like... Well, I mean, you got a scholarship. It's up to you. Like, if I just think you should just get it over with. And I'm like, all right. I would go back and think about it and think about it. And eventually, I think I only had like 20 more credits to go at that point. I was like, I just got to do it. Just got to do it. You <laughs> I know? just got to do it. Yeah. At 24, though, you end up starting your own uh, agency, though, your, your own marketing agency. Um, it was, I think you were, while you were working at Radio Shack during the day, then uh, off business hours, you were designing websites, logos, packaging, you were managing social media accounts. So did you start to feel like freelance and being an entrepreneur was possibly going to be your lifelong career? Because you have the true skateboards background. You're now starting to design and do freelance for other businesses and people. Does that start to feel like this is maybe the route of where I need to go with my life? Definitely. And I was so like, I was kind of bummed, but also like happy that I had to kind of like step away from true skateboards after a few years of doing it because I had to like finish uh, college and focus on like my career and things like that. And I was, you know, I was straight in like in so many different areas, but um, I just felt like basically having, you know, leaving Radio Shack or trying to get out of Radio Shack was just like the biggest thing for me. I had to just like, feel like I owned something that I was working on. I had like a reward for it as well. I just felt like everything that I was working for was for this co corporation that kept changing CEOs and they didn't even know what they wanted. And mm. it just felt like it was kind of the energy was going nowhere and all these things that I had learned from kind of going to college, but at the same time working on my own project because I would just mess around on like Photoshop all the time. I would mess around making ads and things like that before I started building um, things for other brands. But I just realized like this, entrepreneurship way was just so much more rewarding and I could help so many more people and even myself so much more than what I was doing being you know stuck in that corporate life what was the pull into kind of messing around with creative stuff because it's such an interesting story from interesting story of like growing up skateboarding playing basketball track all these sports and then you're also mixing in kind of messing around with designing like what what do you think was the initial pull into wanting to start creating? Um, it came from when I was a kid. I was always really creative in a sense, and I'd always just try, try to find an outlet for it. Uh, I'd say it really started when I was like probably 16, and I was trying to sell MySpace layouts. Oh, let's like go. Like HTML layouts. That's, that's when I, I learned how to hustling. code. That's when I learned how to code. <laughs> oh, my God. I was like, oh, you want a MySpace layout? I got you. So All you, right, you so. would sell people the, the... Oh, yeah, my friends, i just hook them up for like... It's real cheap, but yeah, like for I know, fun. Yeah, I know, five like, bucks. You felt good, though. Yeah, I'd be like, All right, cool. I'll make, I'll make you a MySpace layout. I'm going to customize it. I would wow. make like the div layouts and stuff. Wow. Was, yeah, that's and when, where it started. And when did the video start to kind of get mixed in? The videos came actually last, which is funny that that's... That's like my thing now because it really went came it started with like HTML and website design and then I was like okay uh, let me go to college for this and you know get better at it and so that turned into Photoshop and making ads making packages and then it came to like product photography and I used to do a lot of product photography for brands and building their ads and then the, I incorporated that with their websites and doing website management and then eventually that stuff, I just felt like I was draining hours and hours and hours. Like at night, I would be up all night just working on my computer, just changing layouts and maintenance and stuff. So I was like, well, I really love photography and I've always kind of like done it for companies and products. So why don't I like start, you know, shooting stuff that I enjoy? Mm. And so 
the photography transition to, into the video when Instagram actually um, started offering videos and I realized how like important videos were to kind of be able to send a message. Mm. It like was so much more than just a moment on like a photo. Yeah. So I started, I really didn't really know where I was gonna go with video because I don't have a film background per se. So um, I just kind of always would think about my video frames as photos. And I was like, well, if I would take a photo this way and it's aesthetically pleasing, like I kind of just taught myself video by, you know, starting with the GoPro and kind of ended up just taking like my first edits are horrible like they always are though <laughs> they always are i'm sure even edits that you see from a year ago you're like cr- like cringing like why did i do that oh, why did it's i do so this so funny i'm like oh, okay where was your mind at but i was so into it man it yeah. just kind of like it yeah it snowballed into all of this i recently to a uh, listened to a recent podcast and i can't name who it was but they said like uh if you aren't looking back on the work you're doing today or the work you're doing a year ago from where you are now and you're not cringing at what it looks like, you're not progressing. Yep. If you continuously continue to grow and you're getting better at your craft, you're always going to look back at your work and think like, that wasn't that great. Yep. And you start to lose that whole relationship with the whole like overthinking. Oh, I think yeah. you, you stop overthinking and you probably see it today where you know you can deliver a product as long as you feel confident with it today, that's all that matters because I guarantee by the end of 2019, what you're putting out this month, you're going to be like, why did I do that? Oh, like yeah. that transition was terrible. The coloring was off and yep. you just go through this whole mental process of like over overthinking it almost, I feel like. Definitely. I yeah, like the biggest thing like as a creator is like kind of almost like when when are you ever done with it? Like mm. when is it actually done? Because I'll like put it on my phone and I'll be like, all right, this is ready to post. And I've probably done 10 revisions after that, too. <laughs> yeah. Just so, edit after edit after like, oh, edit after that, edit. That sound effect could be, uh, well, or that color correction could be. Yep. Uh. Yeah. There's a balance of like, is it good enough? Okay, let's just send it. Let's just not overthink it too much. Exactly. The move to California. Um, Crazy. That, and, and, you know, you said you've been out here for almost three years now. Yep. I'm at almost two years now. I mean, I, I'm from Massachusetts, you're in Florida, so essentially we came from the same East Coast, probably this almost close to the same mileage, um, but you leave you leave Florida, you pack your car, you drive to Laguna, and you come out here to pursue both filmmaking and skimboarding, yeah. and on your website, I read, uh, you had wrote, I made this journey solo, and it was the hardest decision in time of my life. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced within that first year of moving? Um, I would say I kind of just left everything in Florida. You left Radio Shack, the marketing job, like everything. You just said, I'm out. The only thing I didn't leave really was, or that I had still with me was like the sponsors and the passion to keep doing the skimboarding thing. So you're, so you're already moving to California. You already are getting sponsorship deals for skimboarding. Yeah. So I, uh, one of the companies that, um, really like is kind of family to me is uh, hit case, which is my cell phone company, uh, the waterproof case. Oh, see. And like that's, dope. that's kind of like where my video. Um, oh, this is legit waterproof. Huh? Yeah, I've jumped. I've jumped off like cliffs with that. And Damn stuff. the the, and it, the it metal on this too. This is re- le- legit. Oh yeah, that thing. You'd be surprised, and it, it's cool because they've been making them since like the iPhone four. Mm. And um, you know, with all respect to all the other camera companies, because I'm always going to use the camera that's going to be best for you know the moment and whatnot. Yeah. And I, you know, it's crazy that they've really sponsored me since. I don't know, like it's been like six years now and they wow. they were really behind my move to California and like one of the guys there, you know, that named Mark, he was really, really helpful for me to kind of get out of like I just felt like I was trapped a little bit. Like mm. I had so much potential but I wasn't I didn't know what to expect in California and I was a little bit nervous. Well like probably everybody was, but that moved out here but I just couldn't really make that decision and he he knew i was on the fence and eventually like i kind of talked to my sponsors i was like well if i move out to california would we be able to kind of like work something bigger and better and like i think i'll have more opportunities Mm. to offer you guys so them being one of like my biggest sponsors that were behind that really helped me move out here by like still offering me you know my sponsorship package and even more on top of it for moving to the west coast wow so i kind of just one day was like all right i just it's all or nothing now that like 
this is an opportunity for me. And I just kind of had to, I, luckily I had quit Radio Shack and started doing the um, like marketing agency thing mm -hmm. before I left. So I was already not working the nine to five yet. And that's when it really hit me that I was so trapped in Florida because I had that extra time on my hand and I wasn't going to work per se. I was just working from home and I was trying to find waves and I was just driving up and down the coast all the time. and couldn't find any good waves that bad yeah it's just like it there's there's nothing like out here and um i just was wasting so much time and energy in like a, like a circle <laughs> wow so you'd have to literally drive up and down the coast to find waves to practice to get better at. for something that you really wanted you know so you you would find a wave but like a, a good wave yeah you're it's stretch damn and had you ever considered of moving out to California before all this or no? Yes, I have actually. When I was like 21, I really wanted to go right out the gates like after college. I was like, oh, let's go to California, you know, the California Taste dream. The dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and honestly, at that point, I really had no idea what the heck I was going to do in California. I didn't really have like any sort of path of like Instagram didn't even exist then and all that too. So I was really just like, oh, well, let me get a marketing job because I got a marketing degree you yeah. know it was just one of those and I got offered a job in like San Diego and I just was like wow I don't want to do this because I don't this is just another job that I'm going to get tied up in and yeah I don't even know if I'm going to like it so, so it's like you came out here with the mindset that it's all or nothing with this filmmaking and, and skateboarding I'm yeah. not going to just take another job I'm going to find a way to actually make this work and hopefully the brands that I'm working with are going to see the value because it is like an investment right right if I'm if I'm invested in you and I'm in a, and we have a business relationship and you're in Florida and I understand the skinboarding world, I know that if she goes to California where this is a capital of it and we have this relationship established, she could get bigger, she could get better opportunities, which is then going to in return make me more money as a business. Exactly. I want to see her make that move instead of just being in Florida and – I'm sure you're just running around doing the same opportunities or yep. trying to get better when you're up driving up and down the coast and there's no actual waves to actually serve. 100%. That was the that was the pitch. It was like all of that because I just felt like I had so much to, like potential to be filming and like taking photos and all this thing all these things and basically they sent me on a trip to like Portugal by myself when I was like 25 I believe mm. and um they were like, "Well, just go. Just no plans or whatever like just come back with a video and so like I kind of just built a little itinerary for myself and went <laughs> I think we went like uh I went paragliding and then I went skateboarding at every park that I could find and I just did a bunch of stuff and really put myself out of my element because I've yeah. never at that point I had never really even traveled out of the country far let alone by myself so and was, this is for is this for hit case yeah and they paid for that entire trip they hooked it up for Damn. sure and they were like yo like they really want to see me grow as a person and i really respected that from a brand as well so i was like all right well i'll just do it and then i came back with a cool little pov video and with a mixture of you know a lot of different angles and kind of like a go, like a gopro you would see a gopro video and yeah it was it kind of changed my life that trip because i was it led me into the other things you know i ended up going to thailand by myself i ended up go, going to visit them a bunch in canada and just traveling and really just getting out of my element it really took me out from that you know corporate girl that was stuck with like you know the path of going to college and then yeah, getting yeah. your job and then doing all that it really woke me up a lot because traveling teaches you so much yeah, so all these opportunities were lining up, and then that's when you finally made the move. One hundred percent. Oh, okay. Now this makes more sense because there's like this constant, there's this constant relationship that's happening. That now there's a trust, and if she moves to California, then she's gonna be able to make this happen. Yeah. Uh, how would you describe for somebody that's listening and has no idea truly what skimboarding is? Like, how do you describe? Like, oh, you're a skimboarder. What 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 is that? The easiest way I try and tell people, because I get it every airport I go to, they're really? like, oh, what's this boogie board, surfboard? You can pay oh extra? I'm like, okay. Oh, here so we it's go. a skim board. Um, <laughs> it's always a thing. But yeah. um, I would say that the best way to describe it is like surfing without a fin, but mm -hmm. starting from the shore and ending, uh, ending up back at the shore. So instead of starting out at sea and catching a wave, mm -hmm. you start at the shore 
do a U-turn on a wave and come back to the shore. Mm. So you're really just catching a wave kind of like surfing, but you're having to reach that wave. And that's all the extra fun in skimboarding is like you have to slide out to that thing and now you have to surf it and like come back in essentially. And you're going right at this wave. Yeah. Like usually you're going to go, um, you know, at a little angle or like depending on the wave and how it sets up. But, you know, you're going full forces. You're sprinting as fast as you can and you have to drop all in one one motion. You know, there's sometimes you don't even look down at your board. It's just in your peripherals. <laughs> wow and you're just gauging out just judging when this wave's come in if this is the one you want to hit and you're just running full full speed ahead throwing the board in front of you just hopping on and just yeah going all in for it. all in one run too because it's like best to really get on your board as fast as possible and a lot of times you don't even really see certain spots they work differently than others so a lot of times you don't even see the hump coming at you because it's shore break so it like kind of formed from the ground or whatever and it just builds and you just kind of have to know mm. where it's, what it's going to do before it does it did you find that Especially in the early, I mean, I'm sure you still crash nowadays, but, <laughs> but like coming from the skateboarding background where you fall, you're landing on cement, rock, and tar to now you're running at a wave. If you fall, you're landing in the water. Yeah. The, the sun is out, sand in your hair. Not as big of a deal. Like, did you love that aspect of it that yeah. you weren't necessarily just going to get banged up every time? I think that that was part of the drive a little yeah. bit because I was like, okay, well, I love the beach, man. I love being in my bikini. I love the sun. I love the water. Yeah. And you're like kind of skating on it. it. It was really cool. But I did realize really fast, though, that the sand sometimes hurts worse than the concrete mm, because it's it like that rash. On, uh, yeah. And like a lot of times you're in a really bad position to where you need to just get away from your board a lot more than skateboarding. Yeah. Because the board is just so much bigger and it's like the rails are unforgiving. So I've had the rail like go through my shin before. I've had it like hit my foot and take me out for months, you know. <sighs> It's you just got to get away from that board a lot of times. What does it take to get to the professional level? Because I, I would imagine that if there's a skimboarding competition that comes to LA next weekend and I go to sign up, they're not going to let me because I'm I'm not a professional. Like, is there like what's the process to to actually be able to enter into a professional competition? So when I entered um, into like the professional division uh, at that time, the the rules were you had to win um, three competitions in that particular tour uh, in a certain amount of time. Mm. So I had to have a certain amount of wins. So you're basically building a resume. And then once you have that, you can like choose to go pro. Mm. So that's basically how they were doing it in the past. And now like the sport's kind of changing and warping. And so what we're really working on is trying to, you know, have like the brands turn you pro and things like that. So, oh, so it's, it's, it's warping for the better then it's, yeah, it's growing. Totally. I, I would say that, um, I'm special, like, especially what I'm doing on the back end and things like that, and really trying to help build the sport behind the scenes and work with my sponsors and things like that. I have a lot of hope for the future of it yeah you were uh i think it was 2016 and 2018 victoria skimboards women's world champion <laughs> that's bad ass that that competition's pretty crazy so it was it was really nice to win that one what's happening behind the scenes to make to to help you win this i mean i would imagine yes it's you showing up i mean how how often are you skimboarding are you paying attention to obviously you have to pay attention to physical health if you're running all the time totally. you're feeding yourself the right uh, foods like what's happening behind the scenes to allow you to win these championships constant focus on doing something all the time as far as training goes i would say if i wasn't uh skimboarding i was skateboarding if i wasn't skateboarding mm. i was surfing if i wasn't doing any of those things i was in the gym and that's something that um, I do all year round as I'm always going to the gym or always training my body, whether I'm skimboarding or not. So mm. I think that that's always helped me really stay in shape and also um, helped me prevent injury because the number one thing that I was worried about coming out here, especially coming from basketball, was injury because the injuries can put you out, can put you, it's like your job, you know, you can't really, I can't perform if I'm injured. So a lot of what I train for is injury prevention as well. And also just training like my breathing and meditation. I think that's really a lot of it because in that heat and basically when you're competing in skimboarding you have like sometimes you know 10 to only 10 to 12 minutes to compete and you you're judged on your best three waves so really it's you against yourself not really you against the other people yeah. because you could be up against somebody that you think you're going to win against and you could easily lose hmm. and so it's one of those things that you just really really have to be in the right mindset and train yourself mentally so that's what i've especially as i've evolved um as a skimboarder in my professional career i've really really tried to focus on how i am mentally going into my heats and things like that staying calm but also being pumped up when you need to be for that 10 to 12 minutes when you're in a competition so is it like 
they're going to just they're going to score you on the three best waves. So if you hit 100 waves, well, then that is it essentially like you have 10 minutes. You either go for five, you go for 100 waves, however. Oh, so you have to balance like you obviously you're not going to just go every second. You have to kind of time it and, and try to get as many waves as you as you can within that time frame. You got to be smart. Yeah. So that's the thing. Uh, when I first started competing, man, I would just lose so much. Like I just my strategy was completely off, too. And, you know, you're you're against like you know, the skill as well. But really, you know, there's a lot of strategy that's involved is I have to be calm and like, okay, choose my waves, right? It's Mm. all about that wave selection, because you could be going for a wave and you could be like, Oh, that got a sick hit on it coming back up the beach. And it wasn't the way it wasn't you that hindered your score. It was the wave that hindered your score because the next wave coming up the beach that you're not ready to run down to that your your person you're competing against is going to get is a Mm. huge wave that's going to produce a higher score are you guys going at separate times or are they is it every person for themselves like, <laughs> it's like usually like two to three people in one heat wow. um but like once it gets towards the end it's usually like man on man yeah or wow. like woman on woman and i think it's super interesting obviously we talked about you skateboard you skimboard you also surf and snowboard yeah that's pretty impressive it's fun it's cool to cross train like that do you, yeah so do you like do you think you're essentially a unicorn that can do all of them? Or do you think like any, cause I've, I, I did snowboarding uh, growing up, wasn't great. Skimboarded, <laughs> ate it a lot on the water. Uh, I've never tried surfing, but do you think if you can master one, you can, you can probably do the rest or, or do you feel like you're just naturally athletic enough that you can balance on all of them? I think my natural athletics from being a kid and being into everything definitely helps because I didn't start snowboarding until I was like way older because I grew up in Florida. So that was something that- Oh yeah, you're that, not even near a mountain. I forgot yeah, about that. I, didn't I think, think we're like that. 12 hours to the nearest mountain and it was like beach mountain. Not even like, chance. In, you guys would be better ice. off building a sand yeah. dune and then uh, snowboarding down it. Exactly. I think that like just being into sports played a huge role, but I definitely think um, if you're a skimboarder or a surfer or whatever, doing the other board sports it helps you have that knowledge of like heel to toe of mm. like carving and oh, things like right. that it's really a lot more natural mm. do you think skimboarding gets enough respect i know you said it's kind of growing and it's becoming a bigger sport but do you think it gets what it deserves or do you think people kind of bo- like brush it off as like oh <laughs> it, it seems like a hobby thing it's not really a true sport I feel um, I feel like it does get brushed off, but I just feel like it's because of people just don't have the knowledge of it enough. Um, mm. I do. I don't. I feel like I'm not like, oh well, you you disrespect skimboarding. I just feel like they need to know more about skimboarding. Is really what it is. Is there's a lot of people that just need to learn more about the sport, and I think they'll be a lot more into it. Um, I believe it just has so much more to grow, mm. and right now it gets a lot of respect from pretty much anyone that I see f- that actually realizes what's going on and what's yeah. happening. I think what would, obviously the biggest thing is of course you need ocean. That's probably gonna be the only thing that's gonna hold back yeah. a sport from becoming, I mean, it's, I'm sure it's gonna keep growing, but like basketball or soccer or football, you just need open space where yep. ocean, I mean, you can't, you, you yeah. gotta be along the US coast or I mean, you. I guess you could try on some ponds or whatever, but yeah. if you truly want to see the sport grow, I feel like it, it's gonna be near the coastlines or otherwise, you have to figure out another way to to actually get there. So it's really cool what's happening nowadays. And I kind of started to have these ideas when I first moved to California because, you know, being a little Florida girl, you're like, oh, well, I see the opportunities out there and you have dreams of it. And you're like, oh, the California life and things like that. So like, it was really cool, like moving out there later because I almost was like a little kid again when I moved out there when I was 25. It like refreshed me Mm. instead of being like, oh, I've seen this before. I've seen that before. I didn't see any of that stuff before. So it really opened my eyes to a lot of ideas and like, Uh, opportunities that like I don't think I would have thought about and um nowadays they're creating like those wave pools like even Kelly Slater has a wave pool you're right I hear rumors of a lot of new wave pools being like built in different areas of California and just different states and I think that there's a huge huge opportunity for skimboarding there because the only thing skimboarding really needs to kind of like or anything in sports or the Olympics is consistency as far as to judge it and to be able to have something like that you can actually create structure around. So mm. having a wave that is consistent or you can create some sort of structured contest for bigger and you know bigger brands and things like that to get behind. Oh, I think there's I a lot see. of opportunity there in the future. Is skimboarding an Olympic sport right now or no? Nope. No. Is but surfing? 
I think surfing is becoming an Olympic sport. Okay. Uh, skateboarding is for sure. Okay. Um, and I, I do, I, I always like, I dream big, but like, Please, at I the love same it. time, I, I try what, to be What's your feasible. website say? Dream, um, <laughs> dream big, uh, it says something about dreaming and then coastlines or something. I forget. What I try, I almost try not to stick to my own quotes. I, I almost like can't even quote myself, I love but it. what's cool is like, it's always changing. And yeah. I think that's like evolving with me, yeah. but like, yeah, I just, I just feel like, especially when I moved out here, I, I was like, oh my God, there's so many things that skimboarding can do. And then I saw the other perspective where like, this is the mecca of skimboarding. So there's the history of it here. So there's a lot of people that have been around it for so long that they're burnt out. Yeah. So I saw both sides of it. But the greatest thing about that is like, I saw the gaps that they weren't seeing because they don't have that fresh perspective mm -hmm. as I did when I came out here. So it's really cool to kind of bring that to my brands and like kind of have those ideas where I can offer, you know, well, what if we do this? And what if we do that? And kind of just really open the eyes of where the sport could go. And coming from skateboarding, I have just different ways to look at things and what the way that they have sometimes just because you know I was involved with skateboarding brands and the way that they worked and skimboarding's more along the lines of the water sports and as much as they are similar they're they're still very different and yeah. you know like even some skateboarders are like I'm not trying surfing you know they don't want to do it it's just different you know so it's really cool to um, just have the background of different sports before I got into skimboarding I really am happy that it took me a while to get into it and i got into it late yeah you're not narrow-minded on just that one sport you have all these other areas that are pulling you and and probably influence you in some ways yep and even like looking at your website i thought it was really impressive that literally like head to toe you have brands working with you from sunglasses to like your bodysuit to uh the watch shoes shoes with etnies like i was like damn this is literally <laughs> a full works production person you know what i mean um, but one thing recently we got to talk about is the pro model board you, you yeah. launched, which is like, that's amazing to like, so I, whether you're a skateboarder, whether you're a skimboarder, whether you are a basketball player and you have your own pro model shoe, like to have your own board, that's gotta be the greatest thing of all time. And obviously, of course you, with the creative background, you designed it, uh, manufactured by Victoria Skimboards. What was the process like for actually bringing that board to life? It was cool because I have ordered a couple boards from them in the past because we've been working together. Like they've been sponsoring me. And so you try these different shapes and you try these different styles. And um, it's just kind of hard to really narrow down what exactly you want because every wave's different, every spot's different. And what's going to be that board that's really going to kind of be consistently pushing you and progressing you. Mm. So it was cool to really work with even um, Patty, like my boyfriend on different ways. Like he's a professional skimboarder as well. So he, we were able to kind of work work with his shape and my shape and like different ways that like styles of other riders that have their shapes are able to progress and so I narrowed down basically what I wanted in a shape and then decided to just like doodle on my iPad one day and go from different design to different design I'm like I don't like that I don't like that I don't like yeah. that and eventually I was like so that's kind of cool and you're still nervous when I'm like all right here's the final <laughs> piece like let's pop this out yeah. and then Finally, when they were like, all right, it's ready, it's in, you're still like, oh, no, no, I don't know if this is oh, like what man. I wanted. I'm like, oh, should I put the logo on this side or that? Or should I have done this? And yeah. eventually when I held that thing in my hand, I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm so happy with like everything that the way it turned out. And it's like a, is it like a purplish blue? I think it is. That... It's like a teal. And are, those like your, purple, are those your favorite which, colors? Those are like my colors. Yeah. It's kind of like the style. What's cool is I was trying to integrate it with the style that I edit my photos is I have mm -hmm. like kind of like, I don't really always just do a preset. I don't kind of believe in. But, every, really... but everybody has their own the like style. style. Yeah. You know yeah. exactly what to expect. So like I, I couldn't say that I just put a preset, but I definitely have the same style of like colors like that. So. When, when somebody's figuring out their board, do you? kind of like with i know with snowboarding it's kind of uh, the starting point is your height is that kind of similar like depending on how tall you are that'll depend on the length of the board and then how many other variables are there to the actual shape of a skin board i would say the height and the weight have a lot to do with it but really uh the style and your stance has a lot to do with it because some people are very wide stance and some people are very oh. narrow stance and then some coastlines like for east coast you'd want like a, a board that floats you a little more sometimes too based on coastlines sometimes yeah because like the style of like you wanting to hit a smaller wave it could be a smaller board because you're more skatey or it could be a floatier board because of 
uh, waves are so weak and so far out that you need something like a boat. Oh, you need something that's going to push yeah. you out. What's the uh, Austin Keen? Is that his name? Yeah. What, is that the type of board he rides? I feel like that guy just goes from miles. That's a, I think that's just pure, like, just running fast. Because yeah, uh, okay. a lot of us, like, if we run that fast, you can slide that far. It's really, uh, but it's cool the way he's creatively kind of, like, integrated how he's a wake surfer or wake skimboarder, technically, I guess. Yeah. And skimboarding. So it's, like, integrating ocean skimboarding with, like, wake surfing and that kind of thing because a lot of people have never been exposed to skimboarding it's called side slipping and okay. si side slipping like that we use that type of side slipping to reach a farther wave because in the physics of riding your board if you're going to slip slide sideways and have your feet close together there's less um of your body like on the surface of the board so it's going to slide faster like you're skipping a rock wow so like this is a technique of like getting farther out and it's cool like he him integrating that into like wake surfing because people have never seen skimboarding like that and like they've never been exposed to ocean skimboarding either mm -hmm. they're like oh i thought you just skimboard on like the flat land yeah so it's cool that you know us integrating different styles with creativity and social media that people can really that's see that's the beauty of the internet it's just it's just massive playground of uh platforms where you just have to figure out like what you want to create and then put it out there and then all of a sudden you have this huge brand and people want to work with you because you're putting out i mean of course there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and it takes skill to not only ride the damn board but then also <laughs> <laughs> edit the damn thing yeah but it's cool to see that you have these opportunities where you know 15 years ago you didn't you you could have these ideas but how are you going to get other people to believe in it you didn't have that voice out there exactly but uh that's so cool when did the board actually come out for you uh that it came recent. out just a couple of weeks ago yeah. yeah yeah i'm so stoked and it rides like so well you know that's another thing too is like it could look great it could you know you feel right in your hands but you know you don't know what it's like till you get on it and it's cool that like when i got on that board for the first time i was like this is exactly this is what it. i wanted <laughs> any regrets with it yet or no no honestly okay. i really really like it i on, i've had other regrets with boards that i've shaped in the past will be like one little thing i would have tweaked mm -hmm. here and there but I, i'm really rolling with this one pretty well i like mm. it what would be is there another like uh pro piece that you would want to create obviously you have a board would the next thing be like a suit would there be like a sunglass what would the next type of amber piece would you want to create so i don't know if i'm allowed to leak this don't say it. i don't want you to get in trouble okay. then. but we got two things to look forward to this summer okay. two other signature amber toy oh things. okay that's dope yeah. though i don't want you to say anything that you regret <laughs> and then something happens no and... it's cool though because um i haven't really mentioned it i'm dope. like i like to kind of just keep things like a secret and just surprise people so because yeah. i feel like the meat like especially with instagram things can get really saturated really quick so mm -hmm. i've learned to kind of like be like embrace the fact that i post you know when i have something good to post and things like that too that's kind yeah. of just been my style because but then you know you know you throw stuff up on the story to keep people yeah keep, keep them going, yeah keep but, them in tune with what you're doing I, yeah. yeah i'm a big believer of uh don't don't tell the world your plans show them yeah because if something if something happens and it doesn't like I have this really cool shoes coming out and then it doesn't happen and then yeah. people start to like lose trust in you, you know what I mean? It's 100%. almost like you want to, when you put out content or you are building that audience, you want to make sure that what you say you're going to do, you actually do. Um, but that's cool. Two little pieces on the back burner possibly coming out this summer. Yeah, I'm excited for that. What type of impact do you want to have on the skinboarding community? Because today you are 28, 29. 28. You're still young. And obviously I would imagine that, you know, I, I don't know what the, the, professional length is for this type of career but um even look at your website too you're you're talking more about it's not only just about you and skateboarding but it's more of like the community so what type of impact do you want to have on the skateboarding community when it's all said and done i really have always looked at the big picture and i see a lot of potential in not only the women's side but the men's side of the sport but more so what we can do with skateboarding as a sport as a whole as well like giving back i believe a lot in how much the sport has given me not just for my career but how i feel as a person just a way to escape but like the fact that i'm in california for skimboarding like if i didn't have skimboarding <laughs> like i don't know if i would have ever came you yeah. know so i really really believe in like you should give back to what has give to give been given to you and that skimboarding has given me a lot and so what i want to do you know in the future is really find a way to give back to the sport but also give back in a positive way with purpose and basically with skimboarding we can kind of partner with new companies that may help 
help the ocean and you know help mm. the world and the things that are going on right now as we all know is mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of things that we can work on there's a lot of opportunity to really take skimboarding in a way that hasn't it hasn't gone in the past and i want to start to kind of work with organizations and companies and do what i've kind of always wanted to do is just give back and give an opportunity for a dream to other people that haven't had that opportunity yet yeah so being able to travel to like places like costa rica and mexico and all these places that i've been i've been able to see this passion for these people that ride wooden skimboards and they're doing the same thing that i'm doing on like you know a 600 hundred dollar board and it's like holy crap like these people would tell me you know on social media that they're inspired by me but they have no idea how inspired I am by them and yeah. that's really the message that I want to put out there is that everything that you do and every step of the way that you take that you don't see your progression it's you're putting that out there to the world and you never know who you may be influencing how do you how has your perspective on the world changed as you've been traveling you know as we talked about before you even moved to California you're traveling for the brand to make content for them now you're at a point where you're traveling for your passion for actually skimboarding how has your perspective changed in the way you see the world? And if, and even more so, is there a certain country or moment that you just kind of like had to take a step back and like, holy shit, like this is, this is real life. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think I had that holy shit moment in Mexico, like last year. Um, there's a really small town there called Malaque and it's a really special place. And I've, like I was telling you before how there's not too many girls that like skimboard, but I guess like when I went down there, I'd never really realized how many girls they started like a little girls community down there and uh one of my one of my friends down there um that I've been fortunate enough to become friends with she kind of started this thing called Skim Fate Mex and it's like a Mexico girls community and I went down there and I, we were just going out you know for a beer after skimboarding for a day and all these girls came running up to me like a group of them and they were like oh my gosh you're here you're you're real like you came to my my home like you know and it's just it was an insane moment for me to realize like they brought me so much like warmth and joy that like holy crap this is why i skimboard and mm. this is why i do what i do mm. and it was really that moment of like i want to keep going and I, this was actually off to, after i had already made like a trip to like costa rica with the girls to give back a skimboard and do all these things like and start this movement but it never really hit me yet you know mm. and that was a moment where i was like man like I want these girls just to be so stoked. Like I want them, if they look up to skimboarding and me this much, like I want to be able to build that dream for them and make this real, like I didn't have a path for me and I didn't see anything of what I was doing. I was literally just day by day hoping that, hope this works out. And I want to be able to pave that path for them to maybe possibly have that dream because I was talking to a 14 year old girl there at one time and we barely spoke any English. We were using Google Tran oh she was ba she barely spoke any English and we were using Google Translator mm. just to speak and I finally used the translator and I said, What do you want to be when you're older? And she said, I want to be like you, a pro skimboarder wow. and my heart just like melted because I'm thinking to myself, Well, I wanted to be a pro skimboarder too and I'm a pro skimboarder now, but I feel like I'm one of the only pro skimboarder females that's living off of it and making a living off of it. So to me it's like, Wow, you want this dream that I don't I don't know how you're gonna do it, but I wanna create this path for you to do it. Wow. So that was a really like awakening moment for me when I went down there on that trip. And I feel like you're only gonna to continue to see that as you keep progressing in your own career and you keep yep. you know pushing forward and uh, you're gonna get messages, you're gonna meet people that are gonna, I, I think that's the hardest thing to realize is that you're you're affecting people without you even knowing it. Like right. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously in totally. that moment you realize like, how much this is helping somebody, but uh, you don't even realize that there's somebody on social media right now that's probably following you that you give them inspiration to keep getting back on the skimboard or to even chase a different passion. But it's it, it's it, the amount of ripple effect, that's what I'm looking yeah. for, that you can have on somebody's life without even realizing it for just naturally doing what you seem to yeah. be is the thing of, I wanna chase my passion for filmmaking and skimboarding and along the way, you're having all this positive energy get shifted out to other people. It's it's, it's incredible. It's yeah, incredible. I think one of the girls that is my biggest inspiration in skimboarding right now, um, she even told me, you know, like, hey, I saw your videos and it kind of helped motivate me to 
start skimboarding again and she kind of had the same situation where she was inland and not making it to the beach as much and she saw my content and now like we're really good friends and she's one of my biggest inspirations in skimboarding because she shreds and i'm like oh my gosh <laughs> she like, shreds. like she freaking shreds and when we compete together i'm like oh shit uh, like I you know you. like, like my girl's about you. to take me down <laughs> like so it's one of those things where it's just full circle sometimes and you don't really realize it until you just have a conversation with somebody someday and you're like oh my gosh all these pieces that were put together and if i never would have done this or that and everything happens for a reason for you know if you're putting out the right energy and that's kind of where that quote came from where in that video is as long as i was putting it out there in the right ways i felt like the money wasn't an issue like if there was days where oh my god like when i first moved to california i had to spend everything i saved to move out here and mm -hmm. i was like well what am i going to do now but i was unwilling to give up i'm like well I'm going to figure out my food today or I'm going to figure out my bills tomorrow. But right now I just got to keep going and I got to believe in this. And I got to know that if I keep hustling, you know, at one point, I think uh, <laughs> it's almost embarrassing to admit. But when I was in California, I just needed to make sure that I had like an extra income. And I was like, I tried delivering for Uber Eats, <laughs> yep. but like I don't. It's it's funny because a lot of skimboarders will look at me and they'll be like, oh, well, you got this or you know, anyone on Instagram, you got this following and this is, they associate like a following with like how much, how successful you are. And that has nothing to do with anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like your success all depends on your happiness. And I realized that so quickly when I got so involved with the corporate world. And then I had this chance to really see how free I could be with skimboarding. It was like a tease. Yeah. And then I couldn't stop chasing it after that. It takes, you know, I think when you go through these moments of, uh, you know, having to like, drive uber eats or whatever that side hustle is you end up appreciating all of this journey that much more yeah because i straight up fund this entire project from uber driving I, uber i respect that more and, than anything and and uh you know it it's so easy for me to just like uh you're getting caught up in the grind and you're just like i just want to make a living doing this thing and it, it to me it's not negotiable it's going to happen but one thing i've realized is how important it is to just stand by like that authentically and just like i just like make a game out of it yeah, yeah. Or not even not even a game i just like poke fun at the fact that like yeah i gotta slay the streets to pay the bills but that's what i gotta do like i'm not sitting creating a facade yeah. like this is the authentic me but you gotta hustle you know what i mean like yep. you gotta find those ways where your bills are being paid and you're like okay how else am i gonna figure this out i gotta go side hustle and I think through it all, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I tell myself that it just makes you appreciate the reward so much more. 100%. So that when I when the time comes and I start cutting a check for making a living doing what I love, I'm going to be so appreciative of those dollars on that check because of how much work it's taking me to get here. Where if I started making a living doing this from episode two, I'd probably be a piece of shit and just yeah. blowing money left <laughs> and right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I would literally just be buying dumb stuff. But now that I've been working so hard at it and punching the bag every single day that when that check finally comes, it's going to be like, amazing. Let's yeah. invest. Let's keep like, let's just keep this thing like going and turning and turning. It means so much more. And that's what, that's also how, when I found your podcast actually is like, I think I saw one of your stories and you were joking about that. And I was like, dude, this guy's amazing. Yeah. Like he's freaking just doing his <laughs> side thing. And he's like, I don't care what it takes to make the money. Yeah. I'm going to do it. And that's so much of how everything I do was founded on. Yeah. And that's what I respect the most is like, even if it's freaking Uber, or if it yeah. was like selling stuff on eBay yeah. or like whatever you gotta it takes. hustle like that's kind of where it started yeah selling MySpace layouts thank yeah. shout out to MySpace shout out to Tom and MySpace yeah, the, white, the white dude, tea Tom had a good Instagram going too for a while Did I don't he? know if you follow him no. he, Tom on, Tom's on Instagram yeah man. I'll have to hit him up I might yeah. have to slide through the DM get him in for I, a podcast yeah. talk about the MySpace <laughs> Honestly, Tom what uh, what was the, the, the direction behind the top 8 because it caused a lot of issues for a <laughs> oh lot of relationships gosh. and a lot of people so what was the direction behind the top 8 oh my gosh the top 8 that's so funny classic bringing that back classic what do you find uh, creating gives you that skimboarding doesn't? I think I think creating um, it kind of gives me, and I wouldn't say like an outlet more mentally, but it's kind of like a way to express myself in a different way. Of like with skimboarding, I feel like I express myself more with 
you know, physically. And mm-hmm. I've always really been able, like really been into that. Like I want to just basically like be playing basketball. I want to be doing something. I have to be doing something active. Like that's like my way to like just get that out. But like mentally, I feel like editing, it's just such a challenge. And like, I really, really enjoy like trying to overcome like the obstacles that it, it brings me. It's like, I'll come to a point where I'm like, wow, I don't know how to even put this, like a puzzle. Like, I don't even know how to put these clips together or this makes absolutely no sense. There's no story here. And it's Mm. almost like, that's what editing kind of gives me. It's like that mental challenge of like strategy and like, how are you really gonna pull a story out of this, these visuals and then also make somebody feel what you're trying to make them feel. And that was what photos and other things didn't really give me is like the full experience of like, if I wanted to express something in a video, I can make them feel with, you know, sound effects or the the visuals or the music that I choose. And if I'm trying to get like a point across to anything, that's like, I feel like that's the coolest way that I've ever been able to express it. And it really draws me into editing in that sense. How do you want people to feel when they click into something you create? What do you, what's the feeling usually that obviously every clip and every video is different, but what should people kind of expect when they're clicking into one of your pieces? Uh, just realness. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing I try and put out. And it's cool that Instagram's kind of changing now where a lot of you know, people that probably used it for the wrong reasons are probably fading out more so than anything because the algorithm. So I never like to complain so much about the algorithm because I feel like it just brings out more of the real Yeah. in a sense of like, okay, well, I am who I am. If you were to walk in on me or anything like that, I'd probably still be dressed like this. I'd probably still be talking like this. I'd yeah. probably, you'd probably still be see me on the beach and see the same person that may be a little different than you would have expected in Instagram because I don't really talk too much to face-to-face to mm-hmm. the camera, but it's going to be real. And I think that that's kind of like the biggest thing that has also like kept me going as well as like, just be patient. You know, obviously I could have a ton of followers if I posted certain pictures that like would just end up in the masses, but Mm -hmm. that's not what I'm about. And I've really stayed true to myself. And it's also allowed me to sleep at night too, because I feel like it's really hard to kind of like be somebody that you're not. And a lot of people could get stuck in that to try and make other people happy. And Mm -hmm. it's cool that like, I've been able to try and keep myself grounded and be like, all right, well, I've had to turn down this gig or that gig, or I've had to go this direction while skimboarding doesn't make a lot of money like surfing or skateboarding. I know that this is my happiness and this is my community and this is what, you know, I came here for and I truly stand behind it. So it's just really cool to be able to for you know live that like so real and not have to worry about any sort of loose ends that i have because you know you get you get what you get when you meet me and all that stuff with anyone yeah and the thing is i think uh it takes a lot for somebody to just be willing to just live the life that they truly want to live and not give into the pressures of the world around us yeah uh but what is probably so natural for you and definitely natural for me is like there is no other option like that to me is the only way i'm gonna live the rest of my life like yeah being that unapologetically myself and and so much of hearing your story today it it shows me like this is like you said like if you see me on the beach if you see a video <laughs> if you see me doing a conversation like this like you're getting the same amber and that yeah that is such a gift because there are so many people that are living in this world maybe somebody that's listening that is trying to live a life that they don't truly want to live because of pressure because they're being told that they need to go and do X, Y, and Z. And it's stories and people like yourself that give people that little insight of like, I don't actually have to do this. Yep. Amber is not listening. She's doing what she wants. She's making a living doing it. She's done all these things to get there to where she is today. Like, I could possibly do this. Um, Definitely. You've, you've also worked with Red Bull, VaynerMedia, Adobe. Why do you think these brands are choosing to work with you of all people? I think they can kind of see, um, I put a lot of attention to detail in my work too. And Mm -hmm. I think maybe uh, I was was trying to pinpoint that as well, because a lot of times it's hard to see your own work outside of your perspective and really see the way that they're seeing it. And I've asked myself that a lot because, you know, you don't really believe in yourself as much as you want to tell yourself in the Mm -hmm. beginning. You're like, yeah, I can work with Red Bull. But like, I've even, you know, there's plenty of people I've reached out to and the first time they probably saw my message, they just 
didn't even care about See me. It. Delete. And delete. then they're messaging me like two years later. Isn't that, that's a good feeling, I bet. Totally. That's the best feeling in the world. I can't tell you how many times that that's happened. And it's really, really made me trust the process. And that's the biggest thing is patience has taught me more than anything. And consistency of like, all right, well, I'm going to just put these vibes out there. I'm going to keep trying and keep trying. And eventually this will all come around one day because one conversation or one thing that I did three years ago, I may pop up right now. And that's something that has happened so much in my career that Mm -hmm. I can't express enough that it's so important to really like, I've really listened to my gut in a lot of ways. That's the one thing that like, if I feel, I go with like, if I feel this is right, I'm going with it. If I feel like this is a little sketchy, I'm not going with it. Mm. And that comes with brands, that comes with ads. Like, there's plenty of thousands of dollars people are trying to throw out there to like put your, you know, product in my Instagram. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to be like, you know, 14. I don't want to see that like 10 year old girl that's like looking at my Instagram and like, well, what? Why is she working with them? Yeah. <laughs> like, I think so much in the shoes of other people that like it's great to see the other perspective, but it's also cool to still be true to me. But at the same time is respect that like, people are gonna have their own judgments and you have to be okay with like, what they're gonna think. But at the same time, you take it with a grain of salt and you can still be you. And as long as you're doing it for the right reasons, that will, people will follow. And that's basically how I've always done anything on my Instagram as well. It's like, if you don't wanna follow me or for any videos or photos or anything that I have out, that's cool because those aren't the people that I'm trying to attract. Yeah. And it's all about the longevity of it. Exactly. Right? Like you're not trying to you're not trying to put out a brand or a product that you don't actually stand by because you know damn well that that's just going to kill you in, in the long run of it all. But exactly. if you keep building on the on the brands and the businesses and the products that you believe in, then it's eventually just going to keep funneling back to you and even at some point it's like okay, money's money do i need this x amount of dollar brand deal probably not because if i say no to this then i'm probably going to do bigger work with red bull or exactly and then that's when bigger brands like that if they see your credibility go out the door they're not going to come knocking on your door again they're not going to want to to keep working with amber yeah and the cool thing is is creating a relationship with these brands has been really really rad it's just being able to separate like as a little kid you're like wow that brand that brand that brand and now it's cool like I'm like, wow, these people behind this brand and this community mm. or this family behind this brand. And I've really been able to be attached to that with each of my sponsors. I really believe in like sticking with a core group of sponsors. And most of the sponsors that I've had, I've had for years. And I really believe that like being loyal is kind of the way that we all win. And at the sense of like, if I'm gonna grow with you, then I know that we're gonna be there when you know we get to that goal. Yeah. And I don't like to like, you know, just take a product and take a picture with it or do a video with it and then just say, see you later. So that's really been a big point of my career too, is just creating these relationships with these people that have really helped me and I just want to help them and give back. And that was the first thing that got me, uh, I think a gig in the beginning was like, I was just working for free, like offering people like, oh, I'll design your logo. I'll help you with your website. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll do anything just to kind of get into this freelance. And eventually it turned into like, well, I I can value my work and, you know, charge for this and that and just kind of went from there. And it just naturally grew and grew. I mean, it all stems back to like with Headcase, right? Like yeah, just that genuine relationship and we believe in you enough. We're going to pay you to fly around the world and to create content. And then now you want to move to California. All right, we'll back you. We stand by what you're doing. Yeah, it's really rad. And I mean, they've they've been great too the, to see like the evolution of me just going from working with Headcase to working with every camera and, you know, the, the best camera is kind of what you have on you, whether that's a GoPro or a Headcase or a mm-hmm. DSLR and just you know we know from starting from the bottom and getting somewhere you just got to work with what you got and i think that that mindset is really what you need going into it because a lot of people are like oh well i don't have this yet and i don't have that yet and it's like well you don't really need all of those things if you have your mind and your creativity and you have the drive to get over those obstacles because like i said before like all my old work i look back at it now and it's like it's just (laughs) a laugh yeah yeah you got to make it work with what you've got. Yep. We're halfway through 2019. What's one goal you want to accomplish before the end of the year? I would say uh, I want to go on another trip and really give back to a community that I've never been to, possibly mm. um, even in Asia or just a, or an island, a small island. I mm. want to really um, go to a place that is pretty, probably exotic, but like 
in a sense of like, wow, I did not know this community existed and really kind of give back in the way that I do by like offering, you know, skimboarding lessons or bringing a skimboard for fun if they don't skimboard there, offering, you know, how to edit and things like that. I really just enjoy going on trips and kind of learning the community and giving back and spending a couple of days with them and trying out the coast and just kind of putting myself out of my element really yeah if you had to uh if you had to recite to yourself one sentence every morning when you woke up what would it be patience that's it oh, oh, <laughs> sentence all right that was a word <laughs> i could take the word too the, yeah because i mean that's pretty powerful but if i had to go with like a sen a sentence um I would just say, honestly, just step by step, because when I moved here and when I even wrote on my website about it was the hardest time in my life moving here, there was a lot of other personal things that I went through in Florida that made it really, really difficult for me to, you know, strip away and be like solo, essentially. Um, so the biggest thing that I reminded myself when I woke up every day, I would, you know, if I was stressed about anything or if I just didn't see the path, I just reminded myself day by day, step by step. And that led me to my patience and led me to take the next step. And what can I do right now with this time that I have on me to be productive? That's mm -hmm. all that matters right now because that's all I have to work with because mm -hmm. I can't be all these different things that I want to be right now. It has to start somewhere. Mm, step by step or day by day. I like that. That's, uh, that's just kind of going back to what I had mentioned to you before I even started the podcast of like, I'm in the present moment. I appreciate the past 135 guests that I've had, but there's no podcast that I'm more focused on right now than this one. And I think that mindset of just like, what can I do in this very moment is so important because yes, there's so much work that always has to get done. But if your mind is running a thousand miles an hour and you're not actually taking advantage of what you have in front of you today, right. you're never going to get anything done. And it's always going to be this constant chase of like, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. So yep. the whole in my world, I always look at it as like one to three wins a day. What are the two to three things that I can do today that are going to put me one, two, three steps forward for tomorrow, do the same thing, do the same thing. But that whole step-by-step -step is, is really important. It's huge, it's especially if for people that have anxiety or like anything like that. I feel like I've dealt with a lot of that, even just traveling solo and things like that. It's just something that I continuously have to remind myself is trust the process and yeah. be in the moment and be present, like you said, and just kind of really know that like if your intentions are in the right places and you continue that path like it'll all lead to the right places yeah what uh what do you think amber Torialba's purpose is i'd say my purpose is to bring perspective and encourage a different mindset in anything that i'm involved with because mm -hmm. when it comes to especially skimboarding that was the biggest thing that I noticed in the sport is the mindset and perspective that people have on the sport. They think because the sport is so small that when anyone asks them, or if you're, are you a professional skimmer? They're like, well, yeah, kind of. Well, I do this on the side. Well, yeah, skimboarding's, yeah. It's like, well, skimboarding's given me so much that I want to be proud of that and when I talk about my sport and I have belief in my sport and really anything that I'm involved with even if you know if nobody made videos which obviously that's a huge industry but mm. if nobody made videos it'd be the same thing mm. so it's like I really have a lot of faith in what this has made me feel and I feel like if it can make me feel like that and other people that I see this huge you know community of different places that it really brings them that passion I feel like there's a lot of hope in it and the perspective can change. Mm, I think it will change as long as you keep doing this, keep like pushing the envelope, keep putting your name out there, keep throwing out the content, standing by the actual sport itself. It's only it's only going to continue to grow as you keep growing as, as a creator and as a professional uh, and doing podcasts like this and putting your name out there. That's just only going to help this continue to grow on the perspective of it, of it all. Exactly. Um, this is when I reverse the role. Before we get into the closing questions, I reverse the role. I allow the guests to ask me any one question. Could be about something we talked about today or something you want to know about me. Two rules. One, it can't be directly about the podcast. Okay. And two, it can't be a question I already asked you today. Ooh. So any one question. That's a tough one because mm -hmm. I think I um, had a question about like your East Coast move. 
Uh, you you could do that. Okay. Yeah, because that's yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Go ahead. I would say the question for me would be like the day or the day you decided to like sign a lease out here or move out here. Mm-hmm. What was your biggest fear? At like what would what would be your biggest fear before you like <laughs> finally made that sign or you made that decision i'm not gonna lie to you i got super lucky in the sense of long story short and then i'll answer the question because we're gonna paint a picture to that moment of signing the lease i have been dreaming of living in california la specifically since i was in fifth grade wow been telling my parents for a long time i'm moving to california i'm moving to los angeles that's (laughs) the place i'm always gonna live red Growing up in Massachusetts, 2,500, 3,000 miles away. I just something about LA always pulled me. Uh, and so, you know, fast forward to graduating high school, I apply to a couple of colleges out here, don't get into any of them. Um, so then I end up going to college in Boston. I figure, okay, I'm graduating. Maybe I should move out to LA. This will be the second chance I can move to California. That didn't happen. <laughs> I was starting the podcast and I realized, thankfully, I thought about this. I said, if I'm going to start a podcast interviewing people, why am I going to move to a city I don't know anybody? I should probably stay in Boston where I just graduated college. I know a bunch of people. Uh, I see a bunch of homies doing cool things. Let me just stay here and work on this. But signing my year lease in Boston, I told myself one year in Boston will give me to build this project and then I'm moving to California. And if the podcast isn't doing what I hope it's doing in a year, I'm still going to move to California. It's a great time to hit a restart. So then you you figure fast forward all the way up into about a month or two before this whole move, I was already in communication with one of my best friends about moving to LA. He was looking to move out here with me for music. And he also had a buddy he went to college with that was looking to move from Oakland back down to LA. He was from LA area. So that started to come together. So you figure... Now we find a place, we find this place, the content crib as we call it. Yeah. Um, we find our our location and before we sign the lease, I know coming out here, I have, I have a purpose of why I'm moving to California. Not only did I always want to live here, but I have a podcast that I'm right. really believing and I want to work on this. Okay, so I have a vision for what I want to do. Two, how am I going to make money? Uber. I was driving Uber full time in Boston. Oh, sick. I'm going to move out here and just transfer everything out here and I'll make a living doing that. What's the next thing? Living situation, of course, the hardest thing for people when they move to a new city. I'm going to be living with one of my best friends and one of his homies from college. I'm already good there. Dope. I already had about four or five friends living in LA that I had met from podcasting. So I had a small network to start with. Okay, I already know people in LA. The last box would be, I had visited this city probably six times before making the move. And two of which were within the past, were within the uh, the year before moving out here. I had come out here to do podcasting. Dang. So you're talking about like, I literally had everything lined up. I just needed to get here and figure it all out. Nice. And so I think having talked to so many people about the scare city of moving to a new place, especially California and LA being the monster that it is. I think the biggest thing that I was just nervous about, which you could argue isn't really something you should be nervous about was just trying to learn the new city. Yeah. I knew coming out here, this is a massive place living in Boston. I mean, it's like 10 miles in radius, essentially you can pop around. (laughs) I knew looking at a map of LA, this place is 40, 50, 60 miles in radius. So I yeah. knew I was stepping into a new environment. And really the the thing that scared me the most was, was I really going to be able to make a living driving Uber? Because if I couldn't, right. what was the next step? I was so comfortable right. with making a living through them in Boston, working on this, giving me the flexibility to sit down and have a podcast with you on a Tuesday at 2.49 <laughs> p.m. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> like you work you are your own boss right now and, and and essentially I am too so it's like it gave me that flexibility where I could create my schedule so I was just nervous about moving here and and how am I going to make a living if this doesn't work right uh and it took a little bit of time I remember the first couple of days I was driving I wasn't really making great money because I hadn't figured out the system yeah, out here true. and I was just like talking to my roommate I was like dude I don't know what's going to happen here. I was like, you might have to help me like pay for gas when we go to the gym every day because yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do. I was bugging out. 
but uh fortunately it uh it all worked out so i think that was probably the scariest thing for me of moving out here was like am i gonna be able to make a living doing what i think i can do but when i look at my when i step outside and i look at the situation i was walking into right. i couldn't have walked into a better situation That's and awesome. i've been very fortunate and it's just been incredible i mean it'll be two years in august that we've been out here and so sick i love it i like the fact that we like we both have never looked back and i've kind of really like people ask me all the time they're like do you miss florida and it's like well i like reminisce on florida but yeah. i don't miss florida yeah per se because it's like i have so much to look forward to and so many goals now that i have my you know i feel like i have so much more to offer out here and it's really great to be yeah. able to have that feeling that's a good feeling because i think there are there's times where people move somewhere and they regret it and they instantly want to go back yeah and i'm I the same nervous. way i love massachusetts i literally have in my instagram bio my area code first slash yeah. la like showing love because I love Massachusetts. I love where I grew up. It's just not where I need to be. I need to be out here where the opportunities are. And the and this is the place that I've always wanted to live. And so right. there is no regret. But that the future, that's what excites me. It's yeah. just knowing like what has yet to come. Podcasts like this and things that I'm working on, that's what keeps me going. And I think, I think what's more important is when you move to a new place, you got to find something you're passionate about or something that keeps you focused. Because if I wasn't doing this and I was just waking up every day going to – work a job for eight to 10 hours yeah. to cut a paycheck and then that was it i'd be thinking about family and friends all the time but every single day i wake up with this fire under my ass to all right i gotta i'm i got a podcast at one then i gotta do i gotta get everything ready for tomorrow's podcast rollout then i gotta work on sending emails yep the mind is constantly staying busy that i don't have time to like sit and dwell and be like oh, i wish i was still in massachusetts but that's exactly the way that i feel same well. thing the yep. same thing uh closing questions one where can people find you on social media if they don't yet follow you already most of my content's on instagram but i have a lot of cool stuff that i'll be uh uploading on youtube more longer pieces uh very soon okay so youtube instagram twitter as well twitter, facebook as well and across then, the board yep even uh, i even use that vero app because it's pretty cool mm. um they're probably another outlet that we might be kind of partnering with for skimboarding as well and instagram is just at amber torialba yep just at that. amber torialba um uh, make sure you guys and gals head to her instagram drop a bunch of bearded man emojis on her <laughs> recent posts and she'll know you came from the podcast podcast oh yeah um before i ask the last question thank you so much for coming in today this has been great this has been something i've never covered before as i told you before like skimboarding uh i was like this this is a cool angle but really when i came across your content and just started looking into what you were doing i love the passion you have uh i think it's awesome that not only do you have a passion for skimboarding but it's also for creating and editing and making content which i am a big content guy as you are here at the content crib Respect. um but just hearing your story today and, and and just how unapologetically authentic you are i think that's amazing and this that's what this podcast is all about stories like cool. you uh, and so thank you for taking the time to be on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's been great. It's been a pleasure. Heck yeah. Last question for you. Uh, for somebody that's listening, hasn't figured out what their passion is, hasn't found that true purpose, what would be the best two to three pieces of advice you'd give them? I would say never stop searching mm. and always keep discovering mm. because you never know when you might just wake up and realize that this is something that you can't stop doing and that you just want to keep working towards mm. and keep working on that even if you don't see the money right now if that's something you want to make a living off of i'd say keep good keep doing it because if it's for the right reasons everything else will come in the future because you can basically open your mind and be creative and kind of make a living out of anything nowadays we do have that great opportunity to be living in the days that we have now and i think that a lot of people should take advantage of that and not settle for what doesn't make them happy create the opportunities for yourself yep Do it. Alba. thank, thank you, you so much. much for coming on the show today man we'll catch you guys next time see ya